I mean, walking into Willie's, <laughs> Willie's ordination, he, uh, we celebrate the fact that he's entering into a fraternity of brothers uh, called the ordained ministers. It's probably a bigger deal than most people think about, especially for an evangelist who, who travels a great deal. People want to know where are you from and who are you and uh, who ordained you and all that kind of stuff. So I get a lot of calls from people uh, where our guys are out there talking with them. They're like, well, who are you? <laughs> Why should I let you talk? And so uh, Willie says, well, call my pastor. Or somebody says, well, call my pastor. So that's how that's done. So we, we thank you for coming. Cause what a wonderful what a wonderful ministry he already has. We're not ordaining him because he don't have a ministry. We're ordaining him because he does have one. And, uh, and he's recognized his gift of evangelists, and so we're here with that. Alf, have you come and bring yours? Good morning. Well, this is a great, this is a great event uh, in the life of our church, in my life. I've been associated with three different evangelists, clearly had that gift that functioned. One of them sitting right back there. And the uh, first one was Chuck Farmer. Many of you don't know Chuck, but many of us do. And he was, he was a great man. He opened a lot of doors for our church. Gary Horton was a man that opened doors for our church, but he, he was a, we were the base where he went out. And he spoke all over, all over, mostly to kids, just like Willie. So I want to speak today, Willie, just very practically about your ministry. Okay, and if you'll turn over on the back, if you've got a sheet, see these diagrams here? I want to show you some very simple things. On the bottom, you see the word grace. Okay, now I want you to listen to me. Look up here and listen to me for just a second. Everything that God gives you, everything that touches God in you, comes through His grace. And what that means is that as undeserving sinners condemned in Adam, unable to save ourselves and un unable to be righteous with God, Christ came and resolved everything that would keep you from being with God forever. He paid it. He resolved it. There is nothing left to pay. There's no payment for your sins. You won't go to the lake of fire because of your sins. You go to the lake of fire because you don't believe in what He did for you. So He died on this cross and paid for all the sins of the world, mine and yours. See, that was a gift. That's called grace. He, was, he died physically, was buried, and three days later did the most remarkable thing. He came back to life. Came back from death. Now, who here can defeat death? He did. And listen, He did it for you. And He said, listen, I've done this. I've, I've, I've resolved your sins in the courtroom of heaven. I have defeated physical death on your behalf. All you have to do to accept and receive that benefit is to believe that He did it for you. And He did. So, that's grace. After you're saved, God gives you a spiritual gift by grace. He empowers it by grace. Meaning that He gives it to you and He, he makes it work, not you. I remember before I got saved and was given this teaching gift, I was the quietest person you've ever met in your life. Literally. If you didn't speak to me first, we never spoke. We could work side by side in an office and if you didn't speak to me first, I might not even know your name. Now that's not a good thing. I'm not bragging about it. I'm just saying. After I got saved and I began to learn a little bit, I could not stop talking. I could not stop talking. I still can't stop talking about God. Not about football. You know, the stock market. But about God and His plan. That's a gift. This guy right here, he can't stop leading people to the Lord. How many now? About 90 people. 
in the last year, two years? That's a gift, see? I just gave you the gospel. I did it in a dramatic way. I don't know who believed it. He gets up and does it. Everybody falls out of their chair to believe it. <laughs> Same with that guy right there. So, grace, after salvation, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit and He gives you a spiritual gift. You see on here, the little guy? See that little guy? I, tr I wanted to make him a whole lot bigger to represent Willie, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> Inside the guy is the gift. Inside the guy is the Spirit, the God, the Holy Spirit, and the gift. The message that you give for people to be saved is called the Gospel. Now the Holy Spirit is the power. He's the power. He makes it work. It's supernatural. Listen, it's not just something you're able to do. It's supernatural. It's something that you didn't know you, you never did before or wanted to do or thought about doing, and now you can help but do. That's the gift. The Holy Spirit makes it work. The gift uses preaching, and the gospel is the person and work of Christ. The gospel is this. This is what you tell people to be saved. Christ died to pay for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, and that defeats sin and it defeats death. And if you believe He did that for you, that moment, listen, salvation is not something you do to work up to so God will accept you. I've been really good lately, God. I've been really trying hard. I've been doing my best. Now, hopefully, I've reached a point where you're going to say, okay, that's good enough. Listen, when you believe what Christ did for you, He grabs you. He grabs you. God saves you. You don't save yourself. He saves you. Once you're saved, you're saved. You are saved. He won't let you go ever. Now, this gift that Willie has, that Gary has, that Chuck Farmer had, this is the gift that brings people into the kingdom. It may be the most important gift that we have if there is such a thing. Because the main issue in your life is where are you going to spend eternity? You do know that after this body dies, your soul continues to live. Do you know that? Your soul keeps on living. This, the you that's really you, it keeps on living. And where it goes, huh, it stays forever. God said, it's so simple to trust what I did for you to resolve all of your selfishness and pettiness that has a price. You just believe what Christ did for you. He died to pay for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. You're in. You're in forever. And you'll be so glad. Now, this is all directed at the unbeliever. And this is Willie's ministry. So first, everything in God's plan comes through grace. The Spirit is the power that gives and empowers spiritual gifts. The Spirit uses the death, burial, and resurrection presented through the evangelist gift to convince unbelievers to believe in Christ. Now, the organizational goal of the evangelist ministry is to maximize the number of people who hear him preach the gospel. If the gift works to the unbeliever, the, the goal would be to maximize the time of the evangelist to be in front of unbelievers giving the gospel. And that's where the ministry goes organizationally. It has to go there to make the most. Listen, this doesn't come along every day. I've been doing this 45 years. After Gary, you're the first guy that's come along in my life that has this gift that I've seen functional. I'm sure others had it, didn't know it. But this is important. What Marion prayed about, this is a beginning. This is a beginning of something new in this nation. It's a beginning. And you, you, you listen, you're part of it. So don't think you can just come to a, some kind of ceremony and then Leave and never think about God again. You're part of something that's important, that's, that's got to be built back. So, 
finally, Willie, godliness in keeping with my G's. I do that to please my pastor. He loves those G's and he loves all those words that rhyme and say the same thing. They start with the same word, but godliness. Now see, here's your ministry. You got the, you're saved. You got the gift. You got the spirit. The gift is working in your life. You're bringing people into the Lord. But as, we, as I said to Willie the other day, there's a difference between your personality and being a nice person. Willie's a nice person. He's as nice as anyone I know. Way nicer than me. But that's not transformed character. There's a huge difference between being a nice person because you're just nice and maybe you don't want confrontation. Maybe you just get along to get, you know, go along to get along. That's personality. That's not what's going to give you power in your ministry. That's not transforming your character to be like Christ so that you can be tough when you need to be, gentle as a lamb when you need to be, and you'll be able to have wisdom to know the difference. When people come to lead you astray, you're going to have to go, no. Well, Willie, we've got this big offer for you, lots of money and lots of people and everything, but you've got to compromise. No, not now, not ever. You've got to be able to be tough. So, character. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. You've got to turn that over. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Tell me if I'm going over time, Ron. All right. Here's a trustworthy saying. If any man aspires or desires to be an overseer or have a position in a ministry. He desires a noble thing. So first of all, you've got this gift. Somebody sitting in this room, multiple people in this room have gifts that are to teach, to evangelize. Several of you here will have that. Now what are you going to do with it? Are you going to develop it? Are you, are you just going to let life cause you to let it wash away? Are you going to develop it? I don't know what God will do with you. I do know what your job is, is to develop it. If you're a teacher, you need to get yourself educated to be able to understand the Scriptures. You've got to do it. Or you, you, know, you'll, you can be useful to God, but you'll never be the usefulness that you can be. You won't be that sharp blade, that instrument that cuts for the Lord. So, Willie says, I want more than just my gift. I want a ministry. He's aspiring to more. Now he's got a team. God just put it around him. Did you put the team together? <laughs> no. No. All of a sudden, it just formed around him. God did that. That's how you know God's moving you on to, because you're willing and you're willing to do this. So, there has to be an aspiration and a desire. Then there's got to be purification. So there's a pursuit and then there's purification, godliness. And he says, this is your credibility. Let me say this to you. You know why one reason the Christian church is not effective anymore? That the Christian, the Christian church is losing people in droves, young people. We have no credibility. Here's what credibility is. So here's what my gift is. My gift is to teach, to train and equip the believer in the pew to grow in grace into this transformed character so that out of your life and out of your soul comes love with a pure heart, goodness, kindness, gentleness, all the things, the character, the fruits of the Spirit become to grow and develop and get stronger and stronger so that when people encounter you, they say, wow, that's different. Something different about that person. What is that? They're peaceful. They're content. They're calm. They're not easily ruffled. Things are going crazy and they're still calm because they got the Lord. That's what gives us credibility. Jesus said, what will cause men to know that the Father sent me was the unity of the church because of unconditional love. That's the credibility. And that comes from transformed character. 
So listen to me, all of you. If your Christian life is just something you do every now and then, and you go and you go to a place where you just you celebrate and you never learn, you never really grow, then you're not really on that on the right path. So really, you've got to stay on that path if you want power. All right, credibility. He said it's necessary for these characteristics to be in place. First of all, above reproach. And this word means you cannot be charged or criticized. So there's nothing in your life that the world can charge you with as far as wrongdoing. Now, who in here is perfect? Does that mean you need to be perfect? Well, I hope not. I hope not, because I don't know what's not right about you. But I did know this. There's something not right about you as far as compared to the Lord. Hello? Anybody else? So what this means is that you keep yourself, you, keep, you be responsible with your, with your behavior in public. It doesn't mean you go home and do whatever you want. It means that you keep yourself clean of scandals. You know what the two, the two biggest things that get ministers? You know what they are? Money and infidelity, sex. Money and sex. That sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? That's because that's what's real. So I already know you don't care about money. Listen. You don't. He had an opportunity when he got this gym that God gave him. He said, well, I can keep on charging people like I always have. I bet this is my business, right? I know John talked with him. I talked with him. I said, well, look, you know, years ago in my ministry, I, I got a counseling degree, and I thought, well, I need to open up a shop and charge for it. I couldn't do it. I did it just a couple of times. I walked away feeling like that wasn't right. See, God never charged me a dime for anything he gave me. Jesus paid for every bit of it. So what Willie did is he, he opened this gym and he said, if you want to contribute, then contribute. If you want to give, then give. We're going to trust the Lord for what we need to live day by day by day. When you do that, so far in my life, I've been doing it 20 years, it has not added up to be a big windfall. But what it has added up to be is the absolute confidence and conviction through proof of God's taking care of me and my family for 20 years now. It's the conviction. When something goes wrong, we don't even blink anymore. You just got to wonder how God's going to take care of that. Because he always does. He always does. He always does. And he always will. So don't worry about the money. And I'm not going to talk to you about the other. Uh, at 48 years old, if you don't have enough sense right now. <laughs> now, he says, the husband of one wife. So, we talked about Willie being married, and I know there's probably lots of women that would like to be married to Willie. Uh, do we see any hands? But you know, Apostle Paul said, if you can be content without, without marriage in your life, then you should do that because it gives you time for the ministry. It gives you time for the ministry. So, but if you're not, then pray and let the Lord bring you somebody. You know, I'm just telling you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interesting fight. So, um, it's going to be the sweetest fight of your life, but there will be a battle. So, secondly, temperate. It means to remain uh, restrained, sober, self-controlled, not reckless or unrestrained, careful to hear and follow the Lord and seek sound counsel for weighty decisions. You don't just act spontaneously. Or, you know, the ministry just got $10,000. Let's go buy a big new piece of equipment. Listen, when, when you live like you do, like I do, and the Lord gives you extra here, you know what that means? It means that there's something down the line 
that that extra is for. Don't go out and go on vacation. It says to be prudent, to mean sensible, sound of mind, have common sense. This is application of biblical principles. Listen, know when you need advice. Be humble about it. Say, I need some help. What do you guys think? You got people around you that, that have been in this a long time that have some wisdom that will gladly share with you. So, you know when you need advice or help or prayer, you pray for believers who are wise in different areas. So he says to be orderly. Cosmion, that's where the, we go, get the word cosmetics. It means to be self-disciplined, organized, respectable. It means to be wise with your time and resources. As I said, Willie, you have this unique ability that God gave you to lead people into the kingdom, and that needs to be maximized. It's not yours. Your life is not yours. The more you're able to surrender it up to Him, let go of the earthly, enter into the, into the new man's spiritual life, the more powerful and the more effective it will be, the more people God will bring into the kingdom through you. So, hospitable means generous to those in need. Able to teach uh, means to be prepared and able to teach the gospel and the word of God. Uh, as an evangelist, as a gifted person, you assist with the growth of the believers in the church. The evangelist has a ministry to the church as well, but mostly to the outside. Not a drunk. I don't know about that part of your life, Willie, but I don't sense any drunkenness in your life. Uh, not addicted to drink, drugs, porn, or anything else. Not a fighter. This is, this is, this is mine because I don't fight physically, but I don't like being confronted. And uh, the Lord has just really confronted me over and over and over again to boil that out of me. But I don't sense that in you, Willie. That needs, again, to be transformed character, not just niceness. It means, it says to be forbearing, uh, to practice restraint, to be gentle, yielding, tolerant, courteous, not a lover of money. Again, this is covetousness. See, people use the ministry for personal gain. Is that shocking to you? Have you ever turned on the television? And, and half the time is spent with begging for money? You know, we teach about money in this church, but we don't ever ask for it. We don't. You know why? We don't want it to be an issue. God gives us what we need to do what we need to do, and we don't want it to be an issue for you. Listen, we need money to function in everything, and we, the more money we get, the more ministry we'll do. Don't ever feel, if you come to this church, that your money is an issue here. And finally, not quarrelsome. I've seen you quarreling and fighting with all these people, Willie. I just want you to stop. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'll just speak from my heart for a minute. Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been in this church 40 years. I've seen it at a, at a heyday seen it when we're down, but you coming along really has really encouraged a lot of us. And, and again, it's, it's not just you, it's this gift in you and what God is doing. If you want to know how to serve the Lord, look at what God is doing. Don't make something up and then ask God to make it work. Don't create a program and then beg people to be part of it. Look around you and see what God is actually doing and go be part of that. You're part of what God's doing in, in St. Clair County. So I'm going to be part of that. So, And I know my wife is. She's dedicated. So thank you. If you have a Bible, open it to 2 Timothy. All you young men that are here to support Willie, I want you to open it. There's a Bible in the pew next to you. And turn to 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. I taught from the first chapter in the first hour. And this is not going to be a message. It's going to be a charge to Willie to become part of the fraternal order of ordained ministers. This is what Paul wrote about ordination. 
I'm in the fourth chapter. I'm going to read one through five. And then I'm going to ask Willie to come up. Paul wrote, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. I solemnly charge you to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Always be ready. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instructions. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrines, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. They will turn their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, Willie, you be sober in all things. You endure the hardships. You do the work of an evangelist. You fulfill your ministry. Paul says there's going to be great times in your ministry and there's going to be tough times in your ministry. People are going to love you, people are not going to love you. That has nothing to do with you. It has to do with your message. It has to do with your message. So don't, don't ever confuse those. Don't ever confuse those two. It's not about you, the man. It's about the man with the message they attack. So I'm going to ask you, Willie, if you would, to come forward. I know there are probably a lot of people you want to thank. So I'm going to ask you to come forward now and thank all the people that you feel is on your heart to thank. And then we'll do the certificate and close. Some of the guys that know me have known me for a while, been to Bible study with me for a while. They know that uh, there are times that uh, things come along and uh, I'll cry in a minute. And uh, I'm going to do my best not to do that today. We'll see how far we get. It may not last long. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have some people um, to thank. First of all, for every single person in here. Um, that's uh, been a part of my life in the past um, and currently a part of my life right now. I can't thank you enough um, for being here, taking time out of your day um, to get up <laughs> and uh, come up here. Um, I love you all dearly. Um, I'm going to start with this, with this church. It's only God's time. It is ironic that the same time that um, Divine Fitness Ministries was uh, being put together over there uh, at 725 Park Avenue that up here at 4135 Booty Parkway this place this church was being put together and four and a half years ago <clears throat> he sent me God sent me a mentor with the name of John Dyer who um, all of you um, in here know and if you don't know you will know here in about 10 minutes um, to uh, mentor me, uh, to get me ready for this, because 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, <laughs> did I see this coming? No. But I had always had thoughts and visions of me standing up speaking, and here I am today. Um, so to, uh, to this church, he blessed me with four, not just one mentor, he blessed her with four, not, not just Mr. Dyer. Mr. Dyer said, made one. Uh, this man has seen me go through <laughs> so much in the last four and a half years, including the, uh, the passing of my father. Um, and then Mr. Gary Horton. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be following in <laughs> this man's footsteps of uh, evangelism because even now to this day, and he's been doing it for a long time, Whenever he comes to speak at our Bible study, this man has those young people's attention for 45 plus minutes from start to finish. Sometimes it's hard for me to get 20 minutes, but he's something else. And then Al, like he talked about um, sitting down and talking with me, and this was just Friday, he and I have sat down in that gym and many other places and had 
some wonderful conversations. He has taught me a lot about ministry and a lot about life. And then Ron, not, not to take anything away from all the pastors I've had in my life, because I've learned a lot from all of them, but I have learned more in the word, about the Word of God from this man than I have any. And I just cannot thank these men in this church enough. And for my latest, uh, my blessing back there at the back, uh, Joan and for Rhonda sitting up front. For, uh, for years, I prayed for a uh, ministry for the girls. And God sent me Joan and Rhonda. And uh, that girls' ministry has grown and grown greatly. And uh, I appreciate those two women <laughs> from the bottom of my heart. This community, this community. Now, I think everybody in this room knows that born and raised in Leeds, <clears throat> I'm a graduate of Leeds High School, I'm a Greenway. I think there's a big game coming up uh, this Friday too. But, but um, my whole, the majority of my life was spent over there for 21 years. I was uh, the announcer for Leeds football. But God had a different plan. So he muddied the waters, stirred them up, and he moved me across the bridge to Moody, Alabama. And did everybody like it or understand it? No. But I've learned I can't worry about what people like and what people don't understand because I've learned that it is more important to be obedient to what God wants you to do. And let me tell you something. Because of that, I have been beyond blessed. So let that be a lesson to all of you guys and girls, men and women. It is more important to be obedient to what God's words, what God has for you to do, than what the world wants you to do. This community, when my dad passed away in 2020, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the people from this community probably had never seen my dad before a day in your life. But you took time out of your day to come over to that funeral home. And a lot of you I saw and a lot of you I see here right now to support myself and my family during that tough time. And that set well in my heart and I cannot thank you enough for that. And Friday night, again, let's <laughs> show what family is. I mean, Wayne was a captain, but behind him, the entire football team, plus the community in the stands. And that young man is loved so much. I'm sure he had support from his former school, too, and they showed that at the end of the game. So to this community, I thank you for um, accepting and taking, this, taking in this old leads, boy. And third, if uh, you guys don't know, that's my mama sitting right there behind Ron. All right, here it goes. I am a, I'm definitely her independent child. Um, I just do things. <laughs> I just do things my way, I guess. And it drove her crazy. <laughs> it, and it probably still drives her crazy now. Um, I have learned so much in my life from her and my dad. Now they had their moments as husband and wife, but they stuck with their vows and they figured it out. They loved each other. What a great example of what marriage is. I've seen my mom over the years being sick and hurt, many other things but she had all of us to take care of. And then my nephew came along later on, and her and my dad, neither one, they didn't waver. They went to work sick and hurting, <laughs> stress and everything else. And Lord knows we stressed them out plenty. I don't know how um, you kids nowadays uh, 
feel or have even received uh, butt whoopings, but I can tell you right now, I can write you a book on how good Joanna Willis Strickland was at whooping our behinds. But I can also write you an even bigger book on how much they sacrificed to make sure that we had and that we didn't go without. And I find myself a lot of times when I'm talking to the, the guys or even sometimes the girls, some of the things that they used to say to us that I never thought I would say, I end up saying those things. So, so mama, some of the sayings that you said to us growing up, uh, these boys and girls are hearing them and they're gonna continue to hear them. But uh, I gotta say thank you, mama, for uh, everything that you've done and just watching you. And I know it's been hard. We talk about it. You know, me and you've had some one-on-one -on -one talks. I know how hard it is with uh, daddy not being here and I wish he was here today, but I'm wearing his suit today. So I just say he's here with me. Uh, but where dad is at, that's where we all wanna go. I've learned with this church, we don't, if you're, if you're a believer, if you're saved, we don't die. We graduate. And my dad graduated. And he's up there, he's waiting on the rest of us. And one more thank you, because uh, I have an opportunity to also do something that I've always wanted to do. And I see Coach Smith here, and um, Coach Smith is the head coach of the East Central Patriots, and that is the homeschool team that I am blessed and honored to be their strength and conditioning coach. And I want to give a, a, a good congratulations to him and the team because this is the fourth year of varsity football, right? And this will be their first year of being in the playoffs. So um, I got to give a, 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 a big shout out to them and thank you for uh, allowing me to, uh, to do this. And thank you for being here also. Now, do I have a little message? Yes. I do. Listen closely. He received 39 strikes because 40 was known to kill a man. They wanted him alive. They held handfuls of his bread, his beard and hair and pulled it out by the roots. They wanted him alive. They kicked, punched, and spit on him for hours until there wasn't a single spot or until there, was, there wasn't a single spot of his body not covered in blood. They wanted him alive. They shoved a crown of thorns down on his head so harshly it struck and stuck into his skin. They wanted him alive. After hours of being whipped, flogged, and tortured, they made him walk with a cross. And that was a 300 pound cross, by the way. They made him carry it. A rough piece of wood with splinters digging into his flesh wounds. They wanted him alive. They wanted him to feel every ounce of pain they could bring. He had to feel it in order for, uh, for, uh, to heal us. Crucifixion, historically, is one of the cruelest, most tortured deaths a human could face. Hours upon hours of torture. Torture most of us cannot mentally think of because the cruelty isn't normal. It's something our minds can, can't comprehend. We celebrate Easter with pastel colors, happy children, hunting eggs, and chocolate. Truth is, there was no fun on the cross for Christ. He could have very well ended it all in that moment. But he came down from heaven unto earth, born of a virgin in human form, and took on the trials and tribulations we deal with. While on the cross for six long, grueling hours, the first three hours he took care of our damaged sin, the second three hours, he saw every last one of our faces in this room. And your sins, and he said, I love you this much. On that cross, he held the rapists, the murderers, the sinners, and the saints. He leveled every playing field and said, all of you, all of you are worth it. He knew he had to carry the cross 
he never promised the cross you carry in this life would not be heavy. He promised that Sunday morning is coming. No matter how heavy Friday is, financially, emotionally, mentally, or physically, Friday is heavy. That cross is weighing you down, and you're about to crumble under its weight. His promise was simply this. He won't make you carry it alone. What kind of king would step down from his throne for this? My Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did this for me and for you. He did every bit of it for you and me. Oh yes, that cross is heaven. So heaven sometimes you don't think that you can carry it one more step. But look up, because Sunday morning is coming. Author of that is unknown. It is ironic that uh, that verse on the wall behind me, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, because uh, these boys and girls have heard it say it, and I'll gladly repeat it one more time. <laughs> that Jesus Christ, everything I just read, there to that cross, died on that cross, for our sin and was buried for three days and was raised from the dead all according to scripture. If you hear that, you understand it and you believe it, then you are saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. The Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave, takes up residence in you. And then you're assigned a spiritual gift. And like Al just talked about, every last one of us here in this room that are believers have been assigned a spiritual gift. And it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. If you don't, haven't been using it, it's time for us to step up to the plate and start using it because we are the eyes, we are the ears, we are the nose, we are the hands, we are the feet of Christ here on earth. And when we sit down and decide that we're just, a, a lot of the excuses, I don't like being around a lot of people or I don't like certain people, I just want to stay at home, we just want to stay in our little groups and stuff like that. No, that ain't what God put us here to do. He put us here to do a job. And we cannot do our job if we're staying at home all the time in our little caves or we're just working with a certain group of people, whatever it may be. We have a job to do. And this ain't coming out of my mouth. This comes from the Word of God, Matthew, um, the 28th chapter, verses 19 and 20. We can't disciple, we can't teach we, and, and baptize if we sitting in, staying at home all the time or just working with a certain group, or just doing certain things. we got to get out. This world needs it. This nation needs it. And like Al talked about, the church has failed them because of that very thing. We run them off because of being uh, also so judgmental. we got to get out of that. There ain't one judge, and that's Jesus Christ. And he'll take care of that either at the, uh, the judgment seat, which well, you want to be at that one. You don't want to be at the white throne. If you're at the white throne judgment, that means... Uh, you have decided that you don't believe in the gospel and there ain't but one destination for you. I don't mind being around the bush about that. Neither. Now, after you've been saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, like Ron said and Al said, positionally, we are sealed and we belong to God forever. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6, even we, we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in, and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You will not lose your salvation. 
you do not go to heaven or hell based on your actions, your behavior. You go for either accepting the grace gift, the free grace gift that Christ gave us on the cross, or not. You do not. So again, we have a job to do. It's time for us to get up and get to work and quit sitting at home thinking about ourselves or just thinking about certain ones. Christ put us here. Christ didn't go to the cross for certain ones. He went to the cross for everybody. So I leave you with this. If there is anyone in here that has not accepted or not sure, I ask you the question, do you know where you will be going when you die. My dad's graduated. Ron's wife has graduated. And I'm sure all of y'all have family members um, that have graduated. And we want to join them for that for one way. And that's through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I'm going to leave you with that. Um, again, thank you for every last one of you for being here for this this moment uh, this morning um, all of you have a special place in my heart and you always will so thank you i love you all and god bless you i believe i'll always look up to you <laughs> <laughs> Willie, it's such a privilege, my goodness. We had no idea four years ago. Did mm -hmm. we? Had nope. no idea what God would do. I wonder what he'll do in the next four years. Wow. I wonder how many of you will follow in Willie's footsteps. We the undersigned upon evaluation and approval of Grace Valley Bible Church, Moody, Alabama. Having had full and sufficient opportunity for judging the God-given gift of evangelists, Christian maturity, call to the ministry, and the sound view of Bible doctrine, hereby certify that Willie James Strickland, Jr., <laughs> is hereby publicly set apart and ordained to the work of the gospel ministry by the authority and order of Grace Valley Bible Church on the ninth day of October, 2022. Willie, congratulations. Ooh. I love it too. We got back. Heavenly Father, we surely thank you for this ordination and the wonderful privilege for acknowledging this gentleman and his fantastic ministry and all of those who have contributed to this day and this victory. Thank you for Ron's teaching and Father give Willie a great desire to learn and know your word and let it continue to minister not just to the bodies but to the souls of these young men and women that he has access to. Thank you for our church. Thank you for bringing us to Moody, Alabama. <laughs> and thank you for your marvelous grace. And more than anything, thank you, Father, for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for his death, burial, resurrection, and his grace that is sufficient for our needs and circumstances. May we honor your name and glorify your son. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand as we pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.